uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the first talk of the fall semester of DCS Plus. So thank you for joining us. Uh, so today's speaker is Avishir Tal. Before we start the talk, I'll go around the table and introduce the groups. Um, so we have uh, the oops, we have the group from Texas A and M joining us. Benjamin, we can't see you. Then we have the group from Stanford, Clemma Canon here. Uh, hi. Then we have the group from ETS Zurich joining us. Hello. Then we have uh, K. Gopalakrishnan from yeah, North Carolina, East Carolina. Then we have Labor here from RCQI. We again can't see you. Then we have, oops. Fatish joining us from MIT. Hello. Um, then we have the group from NYU. Uh, we have the group from Caltech. Hello. Hello. Uh, then we have the group from Toronto joining us. And finally, we have the group from Michigan. Hello. Hi. Uh, oops. Okay. Uh, 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 so, so uh, before we start the talk, the, we have we, uh, we do not we currently do not have a talk scheduled two weeks from now. We are still working on it, but two weeks from then we have Seshadri uh, speaking. So October seventeenth, we have Seshadri speaking. October thirty one, so two weeks from then we have Mihal Kuski, and uh, then November fourteenth we have Vimala Mahadev. We still do not have a talk scheduled for two weeks from now, but we're working on it. So. Today's, uh, um, and uh, as <coughs> usual, feel free to ask questions during the talk, but otherwise you'll be muted uh, during the talk if you, and uh, if you, and today's uh, speaker is Avishir Tal. So uh, Avishir is currently a postdoc at Stanford and was previously a postdoc at IES. And before that, did this PhD with Van Raz at Weizmann. Uh, Avishay has done a fantastic amount of work in circuit com concrete complexity, pseudo randomness, and most uh, the latest work is on quantum computing. And he's going to tell us about separating BQP from pH. So, Avishay. Oh, thank you so much for this uh, great introduction. And thank uh, I want to thank the organizing for uh, inviting me to talk at TCS Plus and for all of you to join me in this talk. So this is the joint work with, uh, as an India mentioned, Ran Raz, who was uh, my PhD advisor, currently at Princeton University. And this is a talk about Oracle separation of PQP and the polynomial hierarchy. Okay, so I will start by recalling some of our favorite complexity classes. So we have P, we have NP, anything that can be verified efficiently, coin P, everything that can be refuted efficiently, and if you want to capture both NP and coin P, you need hierarchy. This is basically things that you can express using alternating quantifiers. And we will see the exact definition in two slides. But this entire uh, polynomial hierarchy sits inside P space, things that we can compute with polynomial space. And we can also talk about randomized algorithms. So for example, bounded error probabilistic polynomial time or BPP is known to contain P and is inside the polynomial hierarchy. Now there's some assumption we think that P equals BPP. But the main motivating question here, uh, for our work at least, it is where does BQP, bounded error quantum polynomial time, sits in this picture? So what do we know? We know that BPP is inside BQP because anything that you can do classically, you can do in a quantum uh, algorithm. And also, we know that you can simulate BQP in P space. So it's somewhere in the middle between BPP and P space. And we would like to get a better understanding where it is, what is the relation between BQP and P, BQP and PH, so on and so forth. So we believe that this is actually incomparable, that BQP and NP are incomparable. There are some problems that can be solved in NP and not in BQP and vice versa. But uh, in order to show such a thing, we really need to separate complexity classes, and we don't know how to separate complexity classes in general. So we don't even know how to separate P from P space. And anything in between is even harder than that. So we need to relax this notion of separation, and we relax it by considering oracle separations. 
And this was considered in the past. So in particular, this work of Bennett, Bernstein, Brassard, and Vazirani showed an oracle separation between NP and BQP. It showed that there exists some oracle in a language that can be solved in NP with uh, access to the oracle A, but cannot be solved with BQP with access to this oracle A. You can see there's some evidence that um, quantum algorithms are unlikely to solve and be complete problems. It's, it's sort of a weak evidence because it's with respect to an oracle, but um, you can view it as an evidence. I want to mention also this uh, seminal result of Bernstein and Vazirani. They show that quantum algorithms are superior to randomized algorithms under oracles. Uh, so BQP is not in BPP with respect to some oracle. You can see it as some uh, supremacy uh, theorem. And this was strengthened in the work of uh, Watrous that showed that uh, BQP is not even in MA, Marilyn Arthur protocol, with respect to some oracle. And this is sort of like a generalization of NP and BPP. Uh, OK, but still, it remained open whether or not there is an oracle separation between BQP and PH, or even between BQP and AM. OK, so Arthur Merlin protocol, which, which is below the second level of this hierarchy. And in this work, we would resolve this uh, problem with respect to an oracle. So our main result is an oracle separation of BQP and PH. And let me just uh, remind you what is PH. OK, so let's define it formally. A language L is in the polynomial hierarchy. If there exists a constant K and some computable relation R, such that membership in the language, x is in L, if and only if, you can write this expression on the right-hand side. There exists a y1, a string y1, such that for all strings y2, there exists a string y3, and you do it for k times, and then you apply the relation on x and all these y's. So what do you require? You require that k, the number of quantifiers, would be a constant, and that the length of these y's these strings would be polynomial in the length of x. Okay, so if you think about it, NP is captured by only just one quantifier. There exists a y such that some relation all on x and y. Co NP is captured by a for all quantifier. For all y2, the, uh, the relation hold on r and x and y2. So both of them are captured in this uh, uh, language, in this, um, sorry, complexity class. And our main result is that we show that there exists some oracle and some language that can be decided in BQP with access to these oracles, but cannot be decided in PH algorithms with access to the same oracle. I want to tell you um, one way to interpret a result, and this was um, this is a quote by Lance Ford. Now, he says, even in a world where p equals to np, even if p equals to np, then also it equals to the polynomial hierarchy. Even making such a strong assumption, that's not going to be enough to capture quantum computing. So there's still going to be problems that quantum computer uh, could solve that classical computers cannot. And, and this is, I think, uh, one way to view this uh, result. Uh, OK, so I mentioned oracles. Uh, I want to, to show you this beautiful picture uh, drawn by Kevin uh, for the Quantum Magazine uh, in the article that they published about our work. So you can think about it as like an oracle. You, you press a button uh, in the middle, and then it tells you, you know, a plus or a minus one. So what, the, what are these oracles? So they are sort of giving you hints that can or cannot help you solve a, a particular problem. And we, when we're doing oracle separation, we, some, we sh want to show that the oracles help, let's say, the BQP algorithm, but doesn't help the pH algorithm. But I will quickly move on to talking about uh, a, a relatively um, a similar uh, model. This is called the black box model. And there are very strong relations between these models. So let me uh, specify what I'm meaning by the black box or the query model. So think of the input X as a huge string of length capital N. And the only access that you have to this huge string is via black box queries. So you can ask, what is the value of the i-th coordinate of X? And then you'll get from the black box Xi. 
Okay, so this will be a plus minus one uh, notation. The plus minus one notation to represent bits will be useful later on in the talk. So when we are talking about this black box model, we are trying to figure out some property of this long string X, and we are trying to do it making as few queries as possible to the black box. If you are talking about deterministic algorithms in this, in this model, they correspond exactly to the decision trees. So the number of queries that you'll do to the black box is exactly the decision tree depth um, of the problem that you're trying to solve. And you can also think of randomized analog, non-deterministic analogs of this model, and quantum analog of this model. And it turns out that quantum analogs of this model are very useful. And so what do you do in a quantum algorithm? Instead of asking about a specific position i, you would ask a, a query in superposition. So you have a superposition over all possible coordinates. For each i, you would have some amplitude alpha i. And you want it to be a quantum state, so you would require that the sum of squares equals one. And then you'll get as an answer a superposition over all possible answer. So each uh, state i will be multiplied by the, the sign of xi. Okay, so the amplitude, the si their size would not change, but their sign would change. And then how do you use this black box? So one query looks like it. That, then you do some post processing. You're doing some manipulation on the, the quantum state, and then you do another query, another manipulation, another query, so on and so forth. And the complexity measure that you're considering is the number of queries. I want to mention what is the analog of uh, the polynomial hierarchy in this model. And this is uh, actually um, bounded depth circuits or AC0 circuit. In fact, AC0 circuits were defined as an analog of pH in the Oracle model or in the black box model in order to uh, come up with oracle separation of pH and other classes, and we will see it later on. And I want to, to now forget about oracles for a second and think just of black box separation. So we will show that some problems can be solved in the black box model using quantum algorithm, but cannot be solved using AC0 circuit. And this, using well-known reductions that date back to the early 80s, this would imply oracle separation between BQP and the polynomial hierarchy. Let me just uh, very briefly mention why does pH correspond to AC0 circuit? So recall that we had this expression, there exists for all, there exists for all, and then some relation. This describes the pH language. We can sort of replace any existential quantifier by an OR gate and any um, universal uh, quantifier by an AND gate. And then we'll replace the relation on the bottom by some DNF. This would give us, basically, from an expression with k quantifiers, we would get to a circuit of depth k plus 2 or k plus 1 um, that captures this in the black box model. So this is the correspondence between these two models. But you can very soon forget about the previous model and just concentrate on this uh, new model. And in fact, I'm going to uh, talk about a question about pseudorandomness. And it, it will turn out that uh, understanding a question about pseudorandom actually would solve the would prove the oracle separation that we want. So what is pseudorandomness? So let's look at this picture. So we have um, on the right-hand side, a truly uniform string. So we have n coins. Each of them is heads with probability half, tails with probability half, and all of them are sort of independent of one another. On the left-hand side, we have a pseudorandom string, a string that looks random and Okay, but then the question is, looks random to who? Who is, who is looking? And there is some function that tries to do some computation on these bits, and these bits should look random to this uh, function. Let me be a bit more precise. So we say that the distribution is pseudo-random against a class of function C. If any function in this class has similar expectation under the distribution D as it has under the uniform distribution. In other words, the, the function cannot tell the pseudo-random distribution and the uniform distribution, um, it will act the same on both of them. So in some sense, it looks random to this uh, class of functions. Okay, so uh, in these two beautiful works of Aronson and Pfefferman et al, they pose this uh, challenge. Can you find the distribution which looks random 
to AC0 circuit or bounded depth circuits, but doesn't look random to polylog time quantum algorithms. If you could meet their challenge, if you can find distribution with these two properties, then they showed a reduction uh, building an oracle separation separating DQP from the polynomial hierarchy. Okay, and I will not then get into uh, much details about how this reduction works, but uh, these are um, arguments that, that go back to the early 80s in the work of uh, um, you know, oracle separation of P and NP. So, so basically these are uh, very classical arguments. Okay. So, so we will meet this challenge. Uh, so just to, to state our, our main result, I, I want the definition of an advantage. We say that an algorithm A distinguishes between the distribution D and the uniform distribution with advantage alpha. If alpha is the difference between the acceptance probability of A on the distribution D and the acceptance probability of A on the uniform distribution. Okay. And our main result is that we present a distribution D such that there exists a log n time quantum algorithm distinguishes the distinguishing between D and U with advantage at least one over log n. However, any quasi polynomial size constant depth circuit distinguishes between these two distributions with advantage at most one over square root n. So as you can see, there is a, a exponential a difference between the advantages of the quantum algorithm and the constant depth circuit. And in fact, you can even make the advantage of the quantum algorithm to be bigger. By standard techniques, you can sort of amplify the advantage of the quantum algorithm by sort of like repeating the algorithm polylog n times. You can get the advantage to be one minus one over poly n. I will not go into these uh, amplification techniques. Let me just uh, prove or, or give you like the highlights of the proof of this main result, showing that you have like a pretty good advantage, one over log n in the quantum algorithm, and a really tiny advantage, one over square root n, with respect to bounded depth circuits. Uh, Avish, uh, I have a question. Yes. So, uh, what is the ro uh, role of like log n versus quasi polynomial in n? Like, instead of log n, if it was log square and a polynomial in n, would uh, would it still be interesting? Yeah. So basically, uh, for the first bullet, I want the quantum algorithm to run in polylog time. So uh, it would work just as well. I'm just saying that the quantum algorithm that we will demonstrate actually runs in logarithmic time, and in fact, it actually makes only one query to the to the you know to the black box so so it's a very simple quantum algorithm but any any quantum algorithm that would work with polylog n time would be a, would be good enough for our result okay so what will be our sorry uh, it's going a bit slow okay Yeah, my, com my computer is not super powerful, so things would, like every time I click, I need to wait like two seconds for it to do something. Okay, so what will be the plan for the rest of the talk? So I want to give you like the proof highlights of this main result. So I want to define this distribution D. And this distribution D, remember, should look random to the uh, constant depth circuit, but should not look random to very simple quantum algorithm. So the second step is I'm going to briefly mention a quantum algorithm. This algorithm was actually given by Aronson and Ambanis that distinguishes between D and U. So basically both one and two were done uh, maybe uh, eight or nine years ago by Scott, uh, but number the point number three was missing. So uh, it was conjecture that the distribution that Scott uh, suggested was to run against AC0 uh, but it was missing, and this is our main uh, contribution. We show that this distribution D, this distribution D, is pseudorandom against constant depth circuits. In fact, we are changing the distribution a bit, uh, the original suggestion of Scott a bit, uh, but and let's uh, see 
how this distribution looks like. Okay, so, so let's start with point number one, the definition of the distribution T. So this is based on Aronson's suggestion uh, for a distribution which he, he called correlation. So he calls it, we, we want to construct distribution over uh, 2n, uh, strings of length 2n. It will be convenient for us to think of string of length 2n, as you'll see from this definition of the distribution. Um, and it will be also convenient to think of capital N I will not have small n, so let's just call it n. So it's, it would be good to think of n as a power of 2. And I would have some parameter epsilon, which is 1 over log n. And you'll see how it plays a role uh, in this slide. And I'm first going to define a multivariate Gaussian distribution. This will be a distribution over real vectors. And then from this distribution, I'm going to derive a distribution over Boolean strings. Okay, so, but let's start with this Gaussian distribution G. So I'm taking a multivariate Gaussian distribution over 2n dimensions. So it's over R to the 2n. It has zero means. And the covariance matrix is this 2n by 2n matrix that has this block, uh, block composition. So I can write it as, as these four blocks, n by n, by n blocks. So the first block is an identity. The second is a Hadamard matrix, then an identity, uh, the Hadamard matrix and an identity matrix. And I multiply all the entries by epsilon. Okay, what is this Hadamard matrix? This is a well-known matrix that is used all over the place. So in communication complexity, quantum computing, uh, you can see it, uh, extractors, so on and so forth. So this is a, a well-analyzed matrix. How does it look like? So all the entries are like plus minus one divided by square root 10. And the sign depends on the inner product of i and j, or rather the binary representation of, the, of i and j. Okay, but actually the only thing that will be important for us, uh, I guess, will be the fact that quantum uh, algorithms can uh, compute efficiently this Hadamard matrix, and the fact that the entries are somewhat small, like plus minus one divided by square root 10. Okay, um, so this would be the multivariate Gaussian distribution. And how do we derive from it uh, distribution over Boolean strings? So we're first going to sample Z according to this uh, multivariate Gaussian G. So then we get a bunch like 2n numbers between minus one, sorry, uh, real numbers. So they can be arbitrarily real numbers. So the first step is that we're going to do is we'll truncate all the coordinates all these two n coordinates to be within minus one one. So if the number is smaller than minus one, we are fixing it to be minus one. If it's between minus one and one, we are keeping it as is. If it's bigger than one, we are making it one. Okay. So now you can notice that the choice of epsilon was crucial for this first step. So I'm, I picked epsilon to be one over log n, so so that with high probability. Uh, all the coordinates will be within minus one one. So this truncation would actually do nothing to the to the vector z. Okay, uh, that's because like each each coordinate has uh, a zero mean and variance epsilon. Okay. Uh, okay. So so then now I got a bunch of numbers between minus one and one, and now I'm going to draw a boolean string from it. So for each coordinate between one and two n, I'm gonna think of this number z, z i as a bias of a coin. And I'm gonna flip a coin with this bias. Okay, so I'm gonna pick z prime i to be a plus minus one val uh, random variable whose expectation equals the value of z i. So let's do a thought experiment. What happens when z one equals zero? Then I'm really just flipping a random coin, right? one with probability half, minus one with probability half. If z1 was uh, one, then I, z prime one would be one surely. And if z1 was like half, then I'm flipping a biased coin. With probability three quarters, I'm one, one quarter, I'm minus one. Okay, so this is as a way to, to go from the Gaussian distribution to the, to the discrete distribution. 
So I want to mention that we, we slightly modified Aronson's suggestion. So Aronson's suggestion was to take Z prime to be simply the sign of Z. Okay, so to go from Gaussian to, to discrete, it just took the signs and we will uh, crucially rely, or at least our analysis crucially rely on the fact uh, that we are um, flipping biased coins with this bias. Okay, and we will see, we will see where it comes from towards the end of the talk. Okay, I want to mention that it's not clear actually that, that such a Gaussian distribution exists. So I just g gave you the covariance matrix, but it's not clear that such a, a Gaussian distribution exists. But so let me be more explicit about it. You can think of this Gaussian distribution G as first sampling N coordinates, X1 to X, Xn, IID uh, Gaussian from uh, the Gaussian distribution with zero mean and uh, variance epsilon. And then taking y1 up to yn to be h times x1 to xn. Okay, and recall again, h is this Hadamard matrix. So now we have x1 up to xn, y1 up to yn, and we simply uh, take z to be the concatenation of the two. So notice that we don't have any correlation between the x's. We don't have any correlation between the y's. You can also show that. The only correlations that we have are between the xi's and the yj's. And these correlations are via this Hadamard matrix. So maybe it's easier to see it uh, in the previous thing. So, so basically, right, so in the, between like the left half, we don't have any correlation between the left half and the right half, we have small correlation, something like one over square root 10. And I want to give you some intuitive idea what's the difference between the quantum algorithm and the classical algorithm. So we have a lot of small pair pairwise correlation here in this distribution. The quantum algorithm somehow manages to accumulate all of them together. So he manages to take all these correlations which are of magnitude one over square root 10 and to get from it something with a big amplitude, which will be something like epsilon or one of log n. We will show that the classical algorithm cannot accumulate them. It can accumulate something like polylog of them, but not more than that. And this would be the main difference between the two models. But this was very hand wavy and we will see the details uh, next. Avishai, I've got a small question. Um, yeah. So here you do the truncation to bring back the Gaussian into the range minus one one. Right. If you did something less, uh, not just uh, a truncation, but just saying like you get a mapping like arc, like the inverse of arctan to get back to minus one one, would, would the rest yeah. of the proof go through, or you also rely on the fact that you actually have a Gaussian truncated? That I haven't checked this. It's something that I want to consider uh, going forward, but I haven't uh, checked it. But I, but I think that uh, probably you are correct. Probably there are different transformation that would like uh, take the reals into uh, minus one one that would work. Uh, we we analyze this this uh, this way of mapping the reals to minus one one. Uh, but yeah, but you are. It's definitely something worth uh, checking uh, whether or not uh, something like arctangents or uh, would work. Um, maybe you can actually improve the parameters if you'll do it this way because I'm really insisting that, um, like, I pick the parameters so that the numbers with high probability with, will, will be within minus one one. And if you're doing some other um, uh, transformation, maybe you will not need this uh, epsilon. Uh, but this. Um, I think we'll have a slight improvement over the results, so not a uh, significant improvement. Uh, but excellent question, thank you. Um, okay, so so we are done with the definition of, of the distribution D and uh, it will be a good time actually if you have a question about this distribution. Um, although we are not gonna use all, all the the properties of it um, it's just to, to make sure that uh, we're on the same page. So basically, if you think of the distribution D, if you look at the first half of the coordinates, it's actually uniform, the uniform distribution over Boolean strings over like n coordinates. Also, the second half is a uniform distribution. Um, and you, you have some correlation between the, the parts. 
Okay. Okay, so now I'm moving to the second uh, step, which is to show that there exists some quantum algorithm distinguishes T from U. This shouldn't be too surprising. Uh, and this is because uh, you know, Scott Aronson came up with this distribution, which we modified a bit, but he came with this distribution and an algorithm at the same time. So he had in mind an algorithm when he, when he cooked this distribution. And I will briefly mention the, uh, how the algorithm looks like. But before saying what, how the algorithm looks like, let's just say what's the properties of the algorithm. So in this work of Aronson and then in the follow-up by Aronson and Lambanis, they gave a one query, log n time quantum algorithm Q, such that on input x comma y, the probability of acceptance of the quantum algorithm Q on this input. So, so this is a probability only over Sorry, this is a probability only over the randomness of Q. Okay, so X and Y, you should think of them as fixed. And I'm looking, what is the probability that Q accepts this input? And this is the probability of the, uh, the quantum measurements. So they show that it's one plus phi of X, Y divided by two, where phi is this very uh, nice expression. It's like one over N to the three over two, sum over I's, sum over J's minus one to the inner product of i and j times xi times yj. So this, this expression, this plus minus one thing should look familiar. This is, looks familiar from the definition of D, but this is actually uh, the, the acceptance probability of the quantum algorithm. So now let's show that uh, using this, uh, this statement, let's show that actually the algorithm distinguishes between the uniform distribution and the distribution D. So what will be the expectation of phi under the uniform distribution? Remember that we are thinking of, of bits as like plus minus one values. So basically we can use linearity of expectation and, sh and show that for each monomial, the expectation of x, i, y, j under the uniform distribution is exactly zero, right? Because uh, x, i, and y, j are independent under the uniform distribution, the expectation of each one of them is zero. It's like, one with probability half and minus one with probability half. Okay, so, th so this is fairly simple. And the other, the other bullet is also simple, showing that the expectation under D uh, is big is also pretty simple. And why is that? So again, we're gonna use linearity of expectation and we're gonna notice that the expectation of each monomial X, I, Y, J is exactly this minus one to the I comma J uh, times epsilon divided by square root n. So we, we get that these plus minus one signs cancel each other out and everything actually gets to be positive with positive uh, sign. So in this way, the quantum algorithm sort of take all these small correlations, these one over square root n correlation and, and gives all of them like a plus sign and then it, it sums them up together. So, so in the end, we'll get that uh, the expectation of phi would be epsilon. Okay, which is um, roughly one over log n. And indeed the difference between the acceptance probability of Q on the uniform distribution and, and on the distribution D is one over log n as we promised. Okay, I didn't really describe to you the quantum algorithm, but it's fairly simple. Uh, I will not go get into much details here, but uh, let me briefly mention how it looks like. So basically you have only one query, so you cannot do too much. So you first prepare a state in superposition over all possible indices. So I think of like um, the coordinates, zero i is like a coordinate in the x part and one i is a coordinate in the y part. So I'm doing some superposition over all possible queries. And then I query the black box. So, so then I'm, I'm getting to step two and I multiply this state zero i with x i and I multiply this state one i with the sign of y i. And then I do some post-processing. So I can apply the Hadamard transformation only on the second half of the, of the state. And I'm sorry if this notation is not clear, this will be the only slide that uses this bracket notation. Um, so if you don't know it, you can just sort of like tune off for one slide and then get back to the next slide. Okay, so when you do this Hadamard transformation, and it's important that you can do it fast, you can do it in logarithmic time, uh, you get this state in, in bullet three, and then you measure the first qubit in the plus minus basis, 
And it's a small calculation to show that the probability of acceptance is exactly this expression that we saw in the earlier stuff. So this was maybe a bit quick, but I, I just want to demonstrate that the quantum algorithm is not super complicated. And it should be surprising because uh, the algorithm came up with the distribution in mind, so or or vice versa. So both of them came came uh, at the same time by Scott. Okay. So now that we finished talking about the quantum part, I want to focus on the main result, which is th the proof that this distribution D is pseudo random against AC zero circuits. Okay. So I want to just make sure that we are on the same page to uh, recall what are AC0 circuits. So we are talking about circuits where we have ends and OR gates. Each gate uh, can read many, uh, can have many inputs, unboundedly many inputs. Okay, so the fan in could be unbounded or the in degree could be unbounded. Uh, the main restriction on the circuit is that the depth is bounded. So the depth for the, the number of uh, gates between an input and an output would be at most a constant. We'll denote the depth by D and the size or the number of gates by S. And we will focus on the parameters where the size is N to the polylog N and the depth is order one or a constant. The reason that we are focusing on this set of parameters is that this is the analog of pH in the black box model. Okay. So what do we know about bounded depth circuits? So we basically really love AC0 circuit in the, you know, in circuit complexity community because we know how to prove pretty good lower bounds towards them. Uh, so in particular, this uh, seminar results of ITI, first Sachs and Sipser, and then Yao and Hustad shows that parity cannot be computed in this model. So it requires uh, more than polynomial size. In fact, it requires more, uh, even an exponential slice. It requires n to the, exponentially n to the one over d minus one size. And this result that parity is not in AC0 is really motivated by the application showing that there exists an oracle such that P space is not in PH. So in fact, the definition even of AC0 circuit was in order to show this oracle separation. So, so it was motivated by this problem. So this is a really classical result. I want to mention that there are a lot of proof of it, but let's look at one particular proof of it uh, that came later by Linear Mansur Nissan based, based on Hastad's uh, switching lemma. So Linear Mansur Nissan showed that AC0 circuits can be well approximated by low degree polynomials. On the other hand, if you want to approximate parity using low degree polynomials, you simply cannot. So if you want to even approximate it slightly, you need degree at least n. So this shows that there is a difference between these circuits and parity, and in particular, parity cannot be in this class. You can even derive from it average case hardness of parity, but let's not go there. So you can try to adopt this uh, proof technique and try to do it for, for our task, but you'll end up uh, facing a problem with this approach. So what will be the problem? So recall that we want to sort of separate very efficient quantum algorithms, making running in logarithmic time and making constant number of queries. And we want to separate them from uh, um, AC0 circuit. However, any quantum algorithm that runs in logarithmic time can be well approximated by low degree polynomials as well. So we cannot sort of compute parity uh, using the quantum algorithm. And it seems that low degree polynomials is not the right language to, to distinguish between the two. And, and this is sort of um, made a lot of people not go in this direction. We were sort of insisting on going in this direction and we were hopeful because we found out the difference between these two uh, polynomials. So. It's true, both BQ log time, so things that can be computed using quantum algorithm in logarithmic time, and constant depth circuits can be approximated by low degree polynomials, but these polynomials are really different. So they are, they are not of the same flavor. So in particular, uh, BQ log time can have very dense low degree polynomials that describe its acceptance probability. In particular, we saw that for phi, for the quantum algorithms that we had before, its acceptance probability is like one plus phi over two. 
where phi is um, a really low degree polynomial. So it has a polynomial on x and y, it's of degree two, but it's really dense. It has n squared monomials. Okay, and you cannot sort of like drop some of them and get a good approximation. On the other hand, in this previous result from four years ago, I showed that AC0 circuits have sparse low degree uh, approximations. So we can look at how many coefficients you have of, of uh, monomials of, of degree k. And this will be something like polylog n raised to the power k. And to be a bit more precise, you can look at the Fourier representation of, of the AC0 circuit and look at the sum of absolute values of sets of size k and show that this is at most polylog n raised to the k. And if you are not familiar with this notation of Fourier coefficient, I will show it in the next slide. And okay, so, so this uh, gave us some difference between uh, BQ log time and AC0 circuit. The question is, it, is it enough? And we will have the first attempt trying to apply this and uh, derive a free analytical proof uh, that D is pseudo-random against uh, AC0 circuits. By the name of the, of the attempt, you, you can sort of uh, guess how it will end up with, uh, but we will be able to, it will fail, obviously, but we will be able to fix it. Uh, okay. Okay, so what is this Fourier expansion? So for any Boolean function, we would use the fact that you can write it uniquely in the Fourier representation as a sum over all sets S. You have a coefficient F of S. This is just a real number between minus one, one, times the monomial product of Xi where I is in S. So this is a way to write a Boolean function as a multilinear polynomial. Once you do it, it allows you to do weird things with, the, with, the, with, with this representation. You can now plug in real values instead of just Boolean inputs. Okay, so because this is a polynomial over the reals, you can just uh, see what is the value of this polynomial over, let's say, the all zero string, the all zero vector or something like that. Over the bool over uh, plus minus one to the two n, the value will be exactly the same as the value of the function. So, so this is uh, what we require, but it's, it's not clear how to interpret its value on over, uh, over the reals. So let's take some uh, vector z in, uh, where all the coordinates of this vector are between minus one and one. Let's think how should we interpret the value of this multilinear uh, polynomial on z? How should we uh, interpret f of z? So a simple claim, is that f of z is really the expectation of f of z prime, where z prime are drawn according to, uh, are, are coins drawn according to the biases defined by z. Okay, so, so again, z prime i would be a, a biased coin whose bias is exactly z i. So how can we prove this thing? It's a fairly simple claim, but just to, to illustrate it, so you can start by uh, considering the, the case where f was just uh, mon one, a single monomial, like the product of xi where i is in s. And then you just use the fact that, you know, expe expectation is of product is the same as product of expectation uh, where we have independent random variables. And, and we pick the z, z primes to be independent. We pick them independently of one another. So this, so this the claim is obviously true for, for a single monomial. And when we talk about a linear combination of monomials or, or a general Fourier representation, then we can just do linearity, use linearity of expectation. So really you should think of, uh, so this claim really gives you a nice interpretation of the value of, of this uh, Fourier expansion or this multilinear polynomial on non-Boolean inputs. And in particular, what is the value on the all zeros input? It's the expectation of F on a, uh, uniform uh, Boolean string, or the expectation of f under the uniform distribution. So this is really something that we want to capture. Okay, so, so I hope that this was clear. So now recall what is our goal. We want to show that the expectation of f of z prime, where z prime is uh, drawn according to d, 
is very simple, similar to the expectation of f on the uniform distribution. How similar something like one over square root? We call how we sample uh, z prime. We sample z according to the Gaussian distribution g, and then we truncated all the coordinates. You can sort of ignore this this step because we said that with high probability the truncation would not uh, take into effect. And then we treated these numbers z1 up to z2n as biases of coin, and we drawn uh, plus minus one va uh, variables independently with these biases. So this should be very familiar to what we had on the previous slide. So really, you can show that the, expe the expectation of f on z prime is the same as the expectation of f on the truncated version of z. And since the truncation version of z is equal to z with high probability, we get that this is very similar to the expectation of f of z when we are not taking any truncations at all. OK, so what does it mean? It means that we can sort of like replace these expressions. So we can replace the first expression by the expectation of f on z, where z is this Gaussian distributed according to the Gaussian distribution. We can replace the uniform distribution with f on the all zeros input. And our new goal will be to show that this quantity is small. So now we really think of like the value of this multilinear polynomial on real vector so the all zero vector and the vector drawn according to a gaussian distribution okay so let's try to to do it and as by the name of the attempt it will fail and we'll see how to fix it so let's try to bound these quantities the difference between these two expectations or between these two things so by definition, I just can write down the, uh, you know, the Fourier expansion of f and sort of do it term by term. So the first term would cancel each other out because f of zero is really only the, you know, like the empty coefficient. All the other monomials are killed by f of zero. So we are left with all these sets that are non-empty. We are left with all these um, sets s, which are non-empty, and we have this Fourier coefficient f of f at of s times the expectation of the monomial uh, product z i where i is in s according to g. Now we can use uh, Iserlis theorem and we are, we're using the fact that we have a Gaussian distribution with zero means and this theorem uh, with, which is like a hundred years old tells us that uh, you know the moment the odd moments of a multivariate Gaussian distribution with zero means are zero. So we can uh, sort of like drop out all the uh, odd degree monomials and we are left with only uh, monomials of degree 2L. Okay, so now I'm like going over uh, the size of the, the set and I'm going over all sets of size 2L and I'm, I'm using the fact that the sets of, of uh, odd size give you, gives you zero. Okay. And now, in order to bound the, the even size sets, I can again use the Serralis theorem, which gives me an expression of, the, of this moment, of this moment in, in terms of the covariance matrix. So it turns out that you can sort of bound this moment by epsilon to the L times L factorial divided by square root n to the L. Okay, so this is some calculations that, that needs to be done, but you can trust me on that. And then you can sort of use the fact that you know that the sum of absolute values of these Fourier coefficients is not too big. It's like polylog n raised to 2L. And you can try to see what does this expression gives you. So for L equals 1, you get polylog n times epsilon times 1 factorial divided by square root n. So you get... Uh, something small, actually what you wanted. You get epsilon times polylog divided by square root n. For L equals 2, you get something even smaller than that, but you'll run into problems when you go to really high degrees. So when L equals square root n, this L factorial turns out to be pretty big and we cannot sort of control the contribution of high degree terms. So we can control the contribution of the first square root n terms, but we cannot control what's going on in this sum. Uh, when we consider the high degree terms. This is where we were stuck, I think, four years ago, and we were 
uh, trying a lot of different fixes to this thing, trying to change the distribution, trying to apply noise, um, and none of them worked until we had uh, uh, stumbled upon a new work that had a very cool and simple idea that helped us uh, push it through. Uh, okay, so the second attempt would be to do a to do a mental experiment. And in this mental experiment, we would do some random walk. Okay, so, so this was a bit vague. Let me be more precise. So instead of viewing this uh, sampling of Z uh, in G as a one-shot sample, we would do it as a result of a random walk, making a lot of small steps. So what are we going to do? We're going to sample T vectors, Z1 up to ZT, according to this distribution G. We're going to do it independently. And then we're going to take the sum of these vectors and divide it by square root t. What do you know about the sum of independent Gaussians? You know that it's a Gaussian as well. And you can sort of calculate the, you know, the means and the covariances. And you would get that the means and the covariances are exactly the same as the means and the covariances of g. OK, so this is really just a thought experiment. We are not really changing the distribution g. We can just view it in this way. And this thought experiment was inspired by this work of Chalopati, Hatami, Husseini, and Dovet, who built pseudo-random generators based on random walks. I want to mention that one difference between our work and their work is that they're actually constructing uh, the generator using uh, a random walk. We are only doing it as a thought experiment in the analysis. OK, so what does this uh, uh, thought experiment gives you? It gives you a way to analyze uh, what's going on in a hybrid argument. You can sort of think of, of your random walk as making a lot of small steps and just trying to understand what's the difference in the acceptance probability between each step. OK, so this would be a hybrid argument. We are defining t plus 1 hybrid. The first would be the origin, OK, the all zeros vector. And then for i going between 1 and t, we'll take the i hybrid to be the sum over the first z1 up to zi vectors divided by square root t. OK, so, first, so let's say the first hybrid is really a tiny vector. It's like it's a vector uh, sample according to, to g, but divided by square root t. The second is like the sum of two small vectors. The last one, ht, will be the sum of many uh, small vectors, so it will not be small, actually. So ht would be distributed exactly according to the distribution g. So how big should you think of t? So you can take t to infinity, and this would give you a stochastic uh, process known as Brownian motion or Wiener process. Uh, we are not using this language. Uh, we, we, I, I believe that we could have used this language, but uh, we, we chose t to be a finite number. And you can think of it as just like a big polynomial in n. Uh, probably picking just t to be n is enough, but, but you can think of it as like n to the 100. Uh, would be more convenient, maybe. And what we are claiming is that the diff, like the expectance probability uh, of f on the i plus one hybrid, is very similar to the expect, like the ex expectation of f on the i hybrid. How similar? We will show that it's something like polylog divided by t times square root n. And then, using triangle inequality, you can show that the difference between like the, the expectation of f on the last hybrid and the first one is something like t times this small quantity, which is polylog divided by square root n. So this would actually, uh, this claim would be sufficient for getting the fact that, uh, you know, g is pseudorandom for f. Okay, so this would, would be the ID. And now let's do a proof by picture. So the, in the first step, we're going to use the fact that this vector is really tiny. And we, we're going to uh, repeat the arguments that, that failed before. And we will see that now the argument works. Again, quite surprisingly, the only coefficients that would uh, 
uh, would matter for the analysis, the only Fourier coefficient of the of the function that would matter are the ones of degree two. So previously we could sort of handle everything up to degree square root n. Here, since we are taking a much smaller vector, we would only need to handle the degree two terms, and everything beyond that will be negligible. And then in the in the i step, we'd reduce the i step to the first step using a very uh, uh, powerful and simple lemma by Chattopadhyay, uh, Khatami, Husseini, and Lovett. And this would rely crucially on the fact that bounded depth circuits of a certain size and a certain depth are closed under restricting some of the variables. So if I'm fixing some of the inputs to be, you know, uh, constant, then I'm not making the the circuit bigger. I'm, I can only make it smaller. So this this is an important uh, ingredient that did not appear in the previous analysis. Okay. So let's do the, the first step. So as I said, it's very similar to what we did before. The, the only thing is that now, okay, so we are taking the difference between the, the hybrid number one and the hybrid number zero. Okay, so it's the same as uh, taking the value of f on z divided by square root t. Okay, so I'm dividing like all the coordinates by a big quantity and think of t as like n to the 100. So I can do the same calculations that I did before. Essentially, every monomial will be multiplied or divided, sorry, by uh, like a monomial of degree 2L will be divided by T to the L. Okay, we, because we are simply dividing each, each uh, variable by square root T. And again, think of T as huge. So really this T to the L would kill this L factorial. So, so that would not be a problem. And in fact, we can show, and it's not, not too difficult to see that uh, the main contribution would be from L equals one. So L equals one gives you poly log N divided by T times square root N. L equals two gives you something divided by T squared. But, but recall that T squared is really much bigger than T. So, so this is negligible compared to the, to the first term. And basically, you can show it for all uh, terms. So this shouldn't be too surprising. You can think of this uh, dividing by t as like applying a lot of noise to the function, so much noise, so that only uh, so it could be really well approximated by a degree two polynomial. And then everything which is of degree higher than two doesn't take into effect. So this is this is actually an idea that we had. We couldn't see how to to make from it a random walk. So, so, so using this idea, you can get that, uh, you know, H1 is pseudo-random against AC0 circuits, but we couldn't show that, you cannot show that H1 can be identified by, by a quantum algorithm. So, so really you need uh, not to analyze only one step, you need to analyze uh, the sum of these T steps. Okay, so, I mentioned that there is a reduction from the general case to the base case. Um, okay, so this is due to this beautiful lemma of uh, Chattopadhyay, Khatami, Husseini, and Lovett. This shows that if you take any fixed vector v and you look at the at the difference of f on v plus z minus f of v. Okay, so think of it as a new function that depends only on z. Okay, g of z. You can write this difference is the expected difference of f row on 2z minus f row on the all zeros input. And what is this f row? This would be a random restriction of the original function f. Okay, so I'm not getting into the details how you pick the, the random restriction, but basically every coordinate will be fixed with probability half and would be kept alive with probability half. And when you fix a coordinate, you will do it according to the, um, you know, the marginal would depend on V. So basically it gives you a way to, uh, you know, uh, bound the difference of two close by vectors. So think of Z, Z as a really tiny vector. So it tells you that uh, for a really tiny vector, the difference of F V plus Z minus F V is sort of like the average of our, uh, the differences of, F row between zero and a really tiny vector. So it sort of shifts two close by points to the, you know, zero and a small vector. 
So this, this would allow us to do some induction. So we will condition uh, where we ended up with under the, after the i-th step. So we'll condition on the value of hi. And with high probability, actually, all the coordinates will be between minus half and half. OK, this is by this choice that we made uh, that, that told us that the truncations doesn't do anything with high probability. So also, this would uh, happen with high probability. So let's condition on this event. And then the difference between hi plus 1 and hi is really the difference between f on hi plus a small vector and the uh, value of f on hi. And now we can apply the lemma and say that this is at most the expectation of a restricted version of f on a, on a small vector minus the restricted version of f on the all zeros input. And now we're using, again, the fact that this class of function, AC0 circuit with certain with at most s gates and at most uh, and def at most d is closed under restriction. So really, f row also has a property uh, that it is a, a small depth circuit. And we can apply the base case on f row and get that this is at most polylog n divided by t times square root n. So this is actually the end of the proof. So we, we managed to prove the, the theorem. Uh, up to some things that I uh, uh, were hiding behind the rug. Okay, so let's do a recap what we saw so far. We defined a distribution D, discrete distribution, based on the Gaussian distribution G. We briefly mentioned the quantum algorithm due to Aronson and Nambanis that can distinguish, this between, can distinguish between D and the uniform distribution. And the main technical part or the main contribution of this work is to show that this distribution D is pseudorandom against AC0 circuits. In order to do that, we did these thought experiments where we thought of this Gaussian distribution G as a result of a random walk, making a lot of small steps. We used the, the result from four years ago in order to show that the first step as a small advantage, 1 over t times square root n. And then we use this beautiful lemma of Chattopati et al. to show that the i-th step can be reduced to the first step. And, and this is basically it. So I want to uh, finish with mentioning some uh, new directions and open problems that I have. Uh, OK. So I see that we are running out of time, so maybe I will just do it very briefly. So I, I want to mention that uh, following up on our walk, Aronson and Fortnow uh, gave an oracle such that P equals to NP and BQP is not in, in P. So this is exactly the quote that you saw earlier from Fortnow. You can have a world where P equals to NP, but BQP can solve problems outside of P. And this uses uh, some uh, uh, new ingredients, so you need to modify the oracle a bit. Also, Lance showed that our oracle, uh, under our oracle, pH, the polynomial hierarchy, is infinite. And this was known uh, for other oracles, and it was known actually under a random oracle, but I think it's interesting uh, to know it uh, for our oracle. And they pose some uh, interesting open problems that sort of rely on, on this result. So you must have this BQPPH separation if you want to, to tackle this, uh, this oracle separation. I will not get into these details, but, um, but it seems that they require more ideas. So it's not, it's not like it's, it's, it doesn't seem that taking our oracle would be enough. OK. So I want to mention a uh, second open problem or, uh, or a second slide on open problems. And this is with respect to pseudo randomness. So you can ask uh, whether or not you can extend this result to separate BQ log time and AC0 circuits with parity gates. And it's, it's sufficient to show a Fourier bound on, you know, a bound on the Fourier coefficient of AC0 circuits with parity gates. And it's sufficient to show that uh, the second level, like the coefficient of sets of size 2, is at most square root 10 divided by polylog. We are very close to showing this. We, we can show it uh, square root 10 times polylog. 
So we're really uh, only a polylog away from, from proving it. And we actually conjecture that the right answer should be just polylog. Okay, this is in a joint work with Ishan, um, Puya, and Shachar. And if you can get our conjecture, then you would get a PRG for AC0 with parity gates with polylog seed length. This is a result that is just uh, motivated by classical uh, computation. And it would be a great improvement to the current best results that we know for AC0 with parity gates. The best PRGs that we currently know have linear seed length. So if you could prove this conjecture, you would go from linear to polylog. Um, okay, so I'm running out of time. So thank you very much. And would love to hear your questions. Thank you, Avishay. Uh Questions? Hi, uh, I've got a, I've got another small question. Uh, when you do the decomposition, one big Gaussian becomes t small Gaussians, and you renormalize. You use the same t basically. You're saying like it's one over square root t g one blah blah plus g t. Uh, would that help? maybe improving a little bit the parameters if instead you weigh them saying like uh, zoom from i is equal one to t of like i times the Gaussian divided by the right normalization factor or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't thought about it. Uh, I mean, this seems like the most natural thing and it works. So I haven't tried to play with this, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't thought about it, I guess. But it makes sense to like this could this seems to to be like another thought experiment that, that could potentially uh, uh, work just as well. Hi, um, maybe along similar lines. So could you just um, clarify where the quantum algorithm fails the lower bound? So. Is it in just, um, does it distinguish a single step or is it in the application of the of the CHHL lemma that it somehow, because... Um, so, so in the yeah. quant, yeah, the quantum algorithm, um, okay, so let's let's see, I, I haven't analyzed the quantum. Quantum algorithms are also closed. Right, but basically, in a single step, you would you would get a small advantage. Uh, you would get an advantage, let's say, one over t in the quantum algorithm in a single step. So you cannot take now t to be big, uh, but you will accumulate you will accumulate the you know the distinguishability along the. But somehow, you still need um, you wouldn't be able. You know, because if the quantum algorithm makes the distinction um, already at the first step and the classical VACs, the circuit doesn't do it, but you wouldn't be able to use just these first two distributions, H0 and H, uh, H1, to just to make the whole argument. You, you still, um, I was confused with that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, maybe this was a bit confusing, but you can do this thought experiment and you cannot do it. Right, so you can ju it's just a thought experiment. So, so the quantum algorithm actually distinguishes between the two of them. If you think what happens in the random walk, you would get that, I guess, that between each step, the distinguishability of the quantum algorithm, something like one over t, or maybe one over t log n. And then overall, the distinguishability is one over log n. So actually, you, can, you are accumulating these small advantages. Right, so there's an amplification argument that's going on. So if you just take one step, the quantum algorithm can distinguish with probability one over t, and the AC zero, zero circuit can distinguish with probability at most one over t root n or whatever the bound was. Yeah. And that by itself is not enough to give you the separation that you care about by naive amplification. And so you have this random walk argument that gives you a stronger, right. better kind of amplification. Right. So it's really important that the uh, so, so in order to carry this argument, I needed t. I, I said that I picked t to be poly n. Actually, you can pick t to be anything which is uh, slightly bigger than polylog. Uh, let's say um, polylog to some uh, omega of one, a <coughs> uh, small omega of one. I mean, uh, but then the advantage of the quantum algorithm would be like in a single step would be uh, like smaller than inverse poly polylog. And then if you want to amplify it, 
to be a constant, then you will want it to, to run for more than polylog steps. So, so this would be sort of a separation. And this is something that we thought about before realizing that the random walk would work. We thought about it, and, but what we, it will give you, it will give you a separation where the quantum algorithm has more resources than the pH algorithm. So it would be sort of like a non-fair game. And such separation are not super interesting because we know that we have time error keys and stuff like that. So it's not like we are actually exploiting the fact that it's a quantum algorithm. Uh, using this analysis, we can even take the number of, of uh, you know, we take, we take the pH to run in almost exponential time and still it, it will not solve the problem. Uh, okay. Thanks. Okay, any more questions? Uh, so in the last, uh, the very last slide that you showed, um, for the, if the L1 norm of the second level is uh, T, then the PRG for AC0, uh, then does it give a uh, PRG with like poly T seed length? Yeah, so it gives a PRG with like something like T squared poly log N. So okay. in fact, even even improving the square root n bound, uh, and I said that we have a square root n bound, even improving it slightly, we'd already improve the PRG parameters. Okay. Uh, I, I, I didn't mention, we have some evidence that make, uh, like I believe this conjecture is true because we have two evidence towards it. So one is that we can do it for the first level. So we can show that the first level is bounded by polylog. We can also prove uh, on all, I guess on all levels, we can do it if the circuit is read once. So if you read each uh, input bit only once, then we can do it. You know, it's, so, uh, and, and this is just for AC0 with parity gates or like any circuit class which is closed under restrictions or something? This is true. For any circuit class that is closed under restrictions. Okay. Um, you should somehow, uh, okay, so one uh, class that doesn't have this property is uh, anything that can compute majority doesn't have the property. So if you look at the sum of uh, Fourier coefficient of sets of size one or of size uh, three in majority, it's big. It's, it's sort of yeah. polynomial in N. Uh, so if you can compute majority, then it sort of would not help you to, to, to use this theorem yeah. or this PRG. But if you cannot, and NC0 circuits with parity gates cannot, then uh, we are hopeful that it uh, Mm. work yeah any other questions okay uh so if there are no other questions uh let me take this offline and again we'll uh we are not here to show off the schedule two weeks from now but uh, let's uh stay tuned so thank you once again thank you very much